how many recipes there may be for the wide, wide world of celebrations, the basic ingredients are always people, mixed well and uh, set out to rise to the occasion. So rising now to the occasion is Gene Rayburn, who will speak briefly on behalf of my old friend Pontiac, which is the hottest car in its price class. wondering what I was doing under this big Pontiac Star Chief Catalina. Well, I was under there marveling at the new Pontiac transmission. Boy, that is the greatest engineering achievement of the year. And this is it. Pontiac's all-new Stratoflight Hydromatic. It's the only type of transmission that gives you all the assurance and control of hydromatic, plus all the smoothness of a fluid coupling. When you want to go Smooth. Just like that. And when you want to get back, just as smooth. Now this smoothie is just one half the power team of the new Pontiac. Here's the other partner in Pontiac power, the big new Stratostreak V8 engine. 316.6 cubic inches displacement. That's a big engine. Up to 285 sizzling horsepower. That's big power. Now, let's go over here, and I'll show you what all this really means to you. If you had to climb a hill that went straight up like this, all you do is step on the gas and climb it like this. <laughs> all kidding aside, Pontiac with that big Stratostreak V8 engine and smooth Stratoflight Hydromatic will get you there faster, safer, more comfortably, and more economically. You'll arrive feeling fresh as a daisy, even if it takes a week of driving to get you there. Now, here's the big surprise of 1956, the price tag of Pontiac. This big Pontiac 860 two-door sedan sitting right here. This car costs less than 44 low-price models. Yes, sirree, you'll pay more for 44 models of the low price three and still not get all of Pontiac's big car glamour, style, and big car goal. So you take old Gene Rayburn's word for it. You don't have to settle for a smaller size, low-powered car. Not at Pontiac prices. You see your Pontiac dealer this week. Our celebrations continue, but now the mood changes once again. The fun on a Midwestern prairie gives way to more somber tones. The crisp air of a Kansas sky is exchanged for the mists of history. We celebrate the memory of a man, and we salute his immortality. One and a quarter centuries ago, when a young man and seeking his first electoral office, he said, every man is said to have his peculiar ambition. Whether it be true or not, I can say that for one, I have no other so great as that of being truly esteemed of my fellow men by rendering myself worthy of their esteem. How far I shall succeed in gratifying this ambition is yet to be developed. That's what he said. Of being truly esteemed of my fellow men by rendering myself worthy of their esteem. The Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C., and the legend that was Lincoln. But behind the legend, there was a man. Honest Abe, old Abe, the rail splitter, the great emancipator, Father Abraham, martyr, savior of the Union, the true American, Abraham Lincoln. The 16th president of the United States, the states he kept united, 
Today, on his birthday, we'd like to celebrate his memory by looking at some of the places that knew him and shaped him and received him at the last. Our story begins a thousand miles away and 125 years ago. This is the land of Lincoln, Illinois, 20 miles northwest of Springfield, the capital, and three miles south of Petersburg. You're looking down at New Salem, a little town that lived and died, and then lived again because a man named Lincoln had made it his home. There is Dr. Benjamin P. Thomas of the Abraham Lincoln Association in Springfield, one of the foremost Lincoln scholars in the world, who will tell you about this tiny town in the wilderness in the prairie of the 1830s. Illinois in the 1830s was a hard place. Most people made their living from the soil, using hand tools and crude farm implements. In many ways, the women worked harder than the men and usually died younger. A man often outlived two wives, even three or four. A settler of the time wrote, the fittest survive, and the rest the Lord seemed fitting to take away. In 1831, a tall, gangling farmer boy walked down that street, saw sights such as these. He was an uncouth young man with a great desire to learn. He was both serious and droll. As a boy, he had written, Abraham Lincoln, his hand and pen. He will be good, but God knows when. Lincoln was 22 years old when he came to New Salem, found about 25 families living here. New Salem has been called Lincoln's alma mater, for it was here that the course of his life changed, and the man he was to become began to emerge. He had been a farmer and a helper on a flatboat. In New Salem, he was a handyman, store clerk, surveyor, self-taught student of law, and postmaster. In fields like those, he drilled his troops as a captain of militia in the Black Hawk Indian War in 1832. He had worked breaking prairie sod and had hired out to split rails, thousands of them, like those in that fence. Here he indulged his passion for education, burning wood chips in the cooper shop for light to read by. From here he walked eight miles to borrow a copy of Kirkham's Grammar. And it was in New Salem that the town philosopher and fisherman, Jack Kelso, introduced him to Shakespeare and Robert Burns. Lincoln went into business with William F. Berry. There's the first Lincoln Berry store. The store is now the post office. And the postmaster, John W. Gellerman, is the direct successor to Lincoln who was postmaster from 1833 to 1836. There's Postmaster Gellerman now, dressed just as Lincoln was, doing his job as Lincoln did. It was as postmaster that Lincoln got in the habit of carrying letters and papers in his tall hat. Sam Hill was the town tycoon. His was the only two-story house around. Lincoln used to act as clerk in elections, held over there in the Hill McNamer store. He got a dollar for this, and sometimes picked up an additional two dollars and a half for returning the poll book to Springfield. Over there is the second Barry Lincoln store, still stocked as it was in Lincoln's day. They sold lard, bacon, and firearms traded muslin and calico for eggs, beeswax, and honey. There in the rear of the store is where Lincoln slept. But Lincoln had little aptitude for business. He wasn't a shrewd bargainer. His store venture failed. 
But he was learning, studying, growing. He learned from the people around him, their honesty, rough humor, patience, tolerance. Learning didn't matter where a man did it, big city or tiny village. He told a young man, I read at New Salem, which never had 300 people living in it. The books and your capacity for understanding them are just the same in all places. Always bear in mind that your own resolution to succeed is more important than any other thing. Lincoln had that resolution in New Salem. He came into the town in July of 1831, as he said it, a piece of floating driftwood. He left for Springfield six years later, a twice elected representative, a man well on his way to becoming a lawyer, a man who, it seems, took all the good things of the place and none of the bad. He was never to lose the prairie strength and simplicity that helped ever after to shape his greatness. On April 15, 1837, he borrowed a horse, put all his possessions into the saddlebags, and rode to Springfield and toward his destiny. 24 years later, he was to pack again, leaving the only home he ever owned, tying the ropes around his trunk with his own hand. His humility and simplicity still apparent in the tag attached. A. Lincoln, the White House, Washington, D.C. It's five minutes to eight on the morning of February 11, 1861. A few friends and well-wishers have come to take a sad farewell of the president-elect. The years as lawyer and circuit rider, his marriage, the birth of sons, the death of one, the great debates with Douglas, his political disappointments and failures are all behind him. Ahead lies Washington and a country soon to be torn in civil war. Representative G.W. Horsley of Illinois and the Abraham Lincoln players help us relive the sad farewell. No one not in my situation can appreciate my feeling of sadness at this parting. To this place and the kindness of these people, I owe everything. Here I have lived for a quarter of a century and passed from a young to an old man. Here my children have been born and one lies buried. I now leave, not knowing when or whether ever I shall return, with a task before me greater than that which rested upon Washington. Without the assistance of that divine being who ever attended him, I cannot succeed. With that assistance, I cannot fail. Trusting in him who can go with me and remain with you and be everywhere for good, let us confidently hope that all will yet be well. To his care commending you, as I hope in your prayers you will commend me, I bid you an affectionate farewell. Bye. 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 Hurry back, Bye. 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 The train pulled away, carrying him to the most tortured four years ever known in public life. Soon the country split and became hammer and anvil, beating itself in civil war. Green fields and brown, red, red with the blood of brothers. Bugles rang out reveille in hills and swamps and plains and prairies, but could never again arouse the thousands and thousands of young men who were dead. For four years, Lincoln commanded massive forces, the greatest armies the world had ever known. He worked and fought and wept and held the Union together. His policy was to have no policy these years, but rather to do what seemed best each day as it came. 
He had said, I won't last long after it's over. And this premonition was prophecy. For in 1865, in the month of April, just as life was returning to the winter world, death reached out and closed forever the tired eyes, stilled the restless hands. And so Abraham Lincoln began another train ride, back a thousand miles to the north and the west, back the same winding way he came, back to his own prairie soil. Through cities standing like weeping women, through crowds of people, past lonely men, through woods grown quiet, through wheat fields and bird song, through apple orchards and hills and hollows, home to the prairie, to rest in the grave. The first stop on the road home, Camden Station in Baltimore, Maryland, where he was to lie in state for five hours and then continue on. First stop on the road home, and soon then the last stop, journey's end. Lincoln returned to the land. And here he lies. He shares this tomb in Springfield's Oak Ridge Cemetery with his wife, Mary Todd Lincoln, and three of their four children. The cenotaph is surrounded by the flags of the United States, where generations of Lincolns have lived. States such as Massachusetts, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Virginia, Kentucky, Indiana, and of course, Illinois. Here also are the colors of the country that he did so much to save. His 48 stars held firm in their blue field. Here, too, is the flag of the office that he served so well.
Abraham Lincoln, 1809-1865. These dates are no measure of the man. His measure is to be found in the words said at his deathbed. His body is enshrined here, but his memorials cover the land in concrete and steel and bronze, as in Washington, and in the hearts of all who have come after him, the greatest monuments of Lincoln were left by himself in his speeches, letters, and other writings. His ideas are alive today, and they speak out to all of us in his own wonderful words. I have often inquired of myself what great principle or idea it was that kept this Confederacy so long together. It was not a mere matter of the separation of the colonies from the motherland, but that something in the Declaration giving liberty not alone to the people of this country, but hope to the world for all future time. Surely God would not have created such a being as man with an ability to grasp the infinite, to exist only for a day. No, no, man was made for immortality. As I would not be a slave, so I would not be a master. With malice toward none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right, as God gives us to see the right, let us strive on to finish the work we are in, to bind up the nation's wounds, to care for him who shall have borne the battle and for his widow and his orphan, to do all which may achieve and cherish a just, and lasting peace among ourselves and all nations. That from these honored dead, we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion. that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. When word of Lincoln's death reached an old woman in a cabin back in Coles County, Illinois, she said, I know he was never coming back, but for millions of Americans, he has never been away. As in all worlds, time slips away in our world of celebration. The memorial is left hushed and quiet now, a still remembrance. <laughs> Pilgrimage is finished, and thousands turn homeward and move down the mountain. But for some time, and for some, the warning merely serves to highlight the gay 90s gaiety of Forest Grove, Oregon. For others, the curtain of night is far away in a make-believe pirate sky. The fragile world we've built 
of celebrations and cameras and people falls like a house of many colored cards. We can pick up the cards, though, and put them together again in our memory. We are straining to contain the holidays and the festivals and the celebrations and the remembrances, calling for our attention, and there are so many of them. Maybe the weather isn't quite as good as it might be. It's been said that we pay back in February for the wonderful weather that we have during other seasons of the year. And that may just be true. A good time, though, for each of us to look around and fall in love all over again with the wide, wide world. The world stands out on either side, no wider than the heart is wide. Above the world is stretched the sky, no wider than the highest sky. Peace. Wide World has been brought to you by your Pontiac dealer. Who sells and services the fabulous 56 Pontiac, a General Motors masterpiece. on Wide Wide World as our live television cameras visit Americans at play at the Sportsman Show in New York City for fly casting, dog trials, and other events. In Miami, Florida, at the 16th Annual Baseball Players Golf Tournament with such stars as Yogi Berra, Alvin Dark, and other baseball greats. Lawrenceville, New Jersey, where four top milers will compete in Olympic tryouts. Burbank, California, for a model plane meet, and where you'll see a fantastic, almost unbelievable square dance of helicopters in midair. Then, Wide Wide World's live TV cameras honor the 10th anniversary of the Strategic Air Command at Travis Air Base, Fairfield, California, where we'll meet the men and weapons of the Strategic Air Command. And for the first time, our live TV cameras will actually take you up in a giant B-36. At Columbus, Ohio, you'll see huge B-47s refueling in midair. Seattle, Washington, where our live cameras will show us around the giant B-52, newest weapon in the Strategic Air Command's armory. So be with us for all these and many other exciting live features next week at this time on Why wide world. For their contributions to the Abraham Lincoln Memorial sequence, Wide Wide World would like to extend special thanks to the Concordia Choir of Springfield, the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad, the Louisville and National Railroad, the Naval Reserve Training Center of Baltimore, and the Boy Scouts of America, over four million strong, who celebrated their 46th anniversary this week. And don't forget John Forsythe starring in Return to Casino on Playwrights 56, this Tuesday night. Bill Wendell speaking. This has been an NBC television production.